point where Uber Dam no longer produces power, it's Deadpool, the, the, the economic ripples are devastating to think about, but now is sort of the hard decisions time, and there's frustration among the states, the seven states and Mexico, that the feds, the Bureau of Reclamation, didn't come and play the heavy, like the, the, the tough parent in the situation, and lay out mandatory cuts, which would force you know, new ways of living and ripping up lawns and changing crops and these sorts of things. But at the same time, the politics in the United States right now are so poisoned uh, for a federal official to turn off a rancher's water right now. Uh, you can just imagine the fireworks. Yeah, and I want to ask you more about that, Bill. Like, in terms of what restri water restrictions are currently in place and the fact that many of those states failed to meet the deadline to agree on steeper cuts, what is the likelihood the federal government will step in here? Well, they said they're going back to the discussions. There's confusion. You know, again, they, they thought they'd get some more firm guidance from above, from Washington. That isn't happening now. And so the biggest, the big daddy at the negotiating table is the Imperial Irrigation District in California, uh, where they grow so much of the produce in this country. They get over 3 million acre feet of water a year. And if they don't want to give that up, they don't have to. They have Supreme Court rights to that water. And that's where the tension comes in. So how it plays out politically, maybe after the elections in November, both local and federal officials will feel more empowered to make tough calls. Uh, but again, the idea that you can take 25 minute showers in the desert, those days have to end. And then they educated the public quite well in Las Vegas. They were using maybe 300 gallons a day. Uh, 20 years ago, now they're down to about 110. They want to get it down to 75 gallons a day. Um, and so it's a gradual education that's happening, but it may be forced by the realities of this. And then as a grim reminder of what's happening, and it's sort of a, a really sad metaphor, the fifth body was found yesterday, or just this week, on the swimming beach here. As the water retreats, all the secrets of the past, there's a, there was a body found with a bullet in, its, in a skull, found in a barrel. They think it might have been a mob assassination. This, this recent one was probably a swimming, a drowning fatality. Um, but if that's not a warning, as you're seeing it in Europe as well, as the Rhine receives, in China they're seeding clouds. So this is really a global story, but it's so acute here in the American West that's been gambling with the idea that, that humanity could, could build lush cities in the middle of this desert. Yeah, and as you say, education really is key. Bill Weir, good to have you with us today. Thanks so much. We're just ahead. More Ukrainian targets hit by Russian missiles and more disruption in Crimea. We'll take you live to the Ukrainian capital next. Plus, amid fears, the Balkans could become another potential hotspot. NATO is holding crisis talks with leaders of Serbia and Kosovo. We'll have the details when we come back. Why is everyone... You know, it's really unbelievable how that now the scientists, and you would have thought that they would have been on to this many, many years ago, whenever the internet, especially after the internet become predominant on the planet, but they're now taking traits and characteristic traits of various places, putting them all together, and they're all having similarity attributes about them pertaining to the water level in these areas that are just draining tremendously and even over in Europe like they talked about um, water is becoming a, a very very precious commodity and I personally believe that it's only going to get worse because it's going to have a bare effect upon to the agriculture communities it's going to have a bare effect towards how people actually uh, are so wasteful here in America pertaining to wasting, wasting waters, uh, especially in other parts of the country, or, or other parts of the planet too as well. And I think before this is over with, we're going to see where water is going to become a more precious commodity than even crude oil. We have done this to ourselves by being blinded by the works of the Luciferian Lucifers, that has blinded society and wanting to blame everything on God. And the thing about it is, we shouldn't blame God, we should blame Lucifer, number one, that blinded society, and we should blame ourselves because we didn't pay enough attention to these mass phenomenon events 
regardless whether it was not enough rain or too much rain. You know, we've seen it again and again and again just recently within the past year in America alone where these monsoons just come out of the sky and just literally inundated places with, with so much rain. And, and, and it's happened over in other parts of the country too as well um, where, you know, places that hardly ever gets a drop all of a sudden gets a flood. And the reason why is because the atmosphere is getting so hot. Hot creates steam. Steam goes up high. And the hotter uh, the atmosphere, the higher the steam, the higher the steam, the more moisture. And whenever the moisture does release, it releases all at once. And then we got people like this right here that we have to have to deal the with. Country. Ukrainian officials say missile attacks hit the Odessa region overnight, injuring four civilians. Odessa, of course, being a major location for grain exports. CNN senior international correspondent David McKenzie is watching the developments for us from the Ukrainian capital. Joining us now live from Kiev. Good to have you with us, David. So Odessa, obviously Ukraine's third largest city, vital to ensuring uh, grain exports. Uh, but again, this region has come under attack by Russia. Well, that's right. You saw these images overnight of a recreational center and some other buildings struck. But what appears, according to Ukrainians, a uh, surface to ship missile that has been obviously converted to hit land targets, a extensive fire there. It really points to the continued efforts of Russia to strike far beyond the front lines of this conflict. There was also a strike to the west of where I am standing. And Ukrainian officials say that in the eastern part of this fight, there's been ongoing very heavy shelling, up to 800 shells and rocket strikes a day on Ukrainian positions. The Russians are inching forward there, even according to the Ukrainians, but it is being a very attritional fight, Linda. And of course, uh, if we can turn to Crimea, David, uh, people seen fleeing the Russian controlled area. Uh, Kiev says its strategy is to destroy Russian supply lines. Well, you see these images again of people leaving Crimea. This Russian occupied peninsula was seen as a relative safe haven for even Russian tourists going to the beach, but that was shattered this time last week with a strike or a blast at an airfield uh, which uh, destroyed several Russian planes. And then uh, on Tuesday, yesterday, there have also been uh, uh, explosions at an airfield, a munition dump, and uh, severe impact on infrastructure there. Now, just a short time ago, my CNN colleagues managed to confirm from a Ukrainian official who was sharing details of an internal report uh, that those uh, blasts, both this week and last week in Crimea, were the result of Ukrainian action. They couldn't uh, reveal their, we can't reveal their identity. Uh, and it's unclear exactly how they managed uh, to do these operations, whether it was long range strikes or it was some kind of sabotage. Sabotage is what uh, Russians said happened this week. And you had the president, President Zelensky of Ukraine, hinting at the fact that Ukrainians need to be careful in those occupied territories. I am asking now all our people in Crimea, in other areas, in the south of the country, in the occupied areas of Donbass and Kharkiv region, to be very careful. Please do not go near the military facilities of the Russian army and all those places where they store ammunition and equipment, where they keep their headquarters. Well, there is a psychological impact with those living in Crimea, of course, and Russians visiting there. And now they feel, I'm sure, that Ukrainians could strike at any time. And I'm sure that was part of the strategy of the Ukrainian military in doing these operations far behind the front lines. David mm. so, McKenzie, staying across the door for us from Kiev, our thanks to you and your team. Well, Russia's war in Ukraine is also heightening concern over tensions in the Balkans between Serbia and Kosovo. The NATO Secretary General is holding back-to-back -back meetings with Kosovo's Prime Minister and Serbia's President today. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is calling for dialogue and restraint. Ethnic Serbs in Kosovo are furious over looming new rules on identification documents and license plates. And when Kosovo first announced the rules, protests erupted prompting road blockades. 
CNN's Scott McLean joins us now for the latest on all of this. Scott, good to have you with us. So the last thing NATO wants is yet another conflict in Europe. Uh, just give us a sense of how tensions have increased in the last few weeks. It goes to show you, Linda, just how tense things are in this region when we're talking about new regulations with respect to license plates that have really caused things to escalate. So today, you, our NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg met, as you mentioned, with the President of Serbia, with the Prime Minister of Kosovo to try to bring down the temperature. And he says that the situation on the ground has improved. But look, it is up to both sides to make sure that it, in fact, stays that way. NATO is not involved in this conflict other than the fact that it is perhaps the key to security in the region. 3,700 peacekeeping troops there. They are neutral. Um, and he said that their mere presence helps to sort of diffuse the situation, but he also reiterated his message that they are prepared to do more. Listen. If needed, we will move forces, uh, deploy them where needed, uh, and, uh, and increase our presence. We have already increased the presence in the north. We are ready to do more, but of course we will act when needed, and we will act in a proportionate way. So he was also asked what the risk right now is in the region of further escalation, and he said that, look, there is always a risk, hence why these meetings are taking place, hence why the meeting tomorrow will take place between the two sides directly, mediated by the European Union. As for what the Serbian president said, Alexander Vucic, he said, look, um, that, he, that Serbia wants peace, but he couldn't help but revert back to his rhetoric of blaming the other side for ramping up the tension, he says, for political gain. You got a similarly uh, a similar message from the Kosovo, the Kosovar prime minister as well, who said that look, people in his country have reason to be vigilant because of the destructive approach of Serbia, saying that these blockades were actually organized by criminal gangs, uh, gangs, excuse me. And he was also asked whether or not the this whole license plate issue would potentially be dropped, and he gave a very long-winded answer uh, that essentially said no. So further talks tomorrow are very much needed to bring an end to this tension because, Linda, this hasn't been resolved. Uh, at the moment, it's just been kicked down the road. Those regulations are set to come back into force September 1st. Yeah, certainly uh, NATO are hoping to mediate and, and decrease the tensions. But just how much impact are these talks expected to have? Yeah, so one of the things that you should keep in mind is that, of course, Serbia would very much like to be part of the European Union in the future, and so this is being dangled as a carrot for the Serbians to sort of uh, get, this all or get this all in order, get this all resolved, because certainly they will not become a member of the European Union if they're still in this sort of perpetual conflict with their neighbor. Similarly, Kosovo would like to become a member of NATO, and you can imagine that that's likely not going to happen either if this sort of conflict continues as well. So both sides have plenty of incentive to actually figure this out and actually move forward. Whether or not they can actually do that is a whole other question. And you have to remember that this goes back to 2008 when Serbia first declared its independence because Serbia never recognized that independence. In 2013, the EU got involved to try to mediate things, though, frankly, there hasn't been a lot of progress made there. This license plate issue, this registration issue, first cropped up last summer. There were blockades then. The EU mediated and came to a compromise, but again, it's flaring up again this summer as well. And as I said, Linda, this has not been resolved at this stage. It's merely been kicked down the road for another couple of weeks. Um, and as I said, the Kosovar prime minister is saying, at least at this point, that they have provided plenty of incentives for Serbs to change over their license plate to, to Kosovo registrations. Um, but the plan, as of now, is to proceed uh, as they were going to a couple weeks ago. Mm. Hopefully we see a resolution soon. Scott McLean for us. Good to have you on the story. Thank you. Still ahead on Connected World, will the latest apparently final push to revive the Iran nuclear deal be successful? What diplomats and experts are saying after Iran submits its response to the EU plan. You know, by watching all of this and weighing in on what we've just been said, not just only about climate changes going on all over the world, but According to the Bible, there's supposed to be a great 
um, conflict over in the Iran, Iraq, Iran, uh, you river Euphrates area, and, and possibly even attacking uh, Israel again. Um, this this thing that that it predicts in the Bible pertaining to the old Persian Empire is truly, truly getting closer each and every day as we can watch certain elements come together in un understanding and identifying that yes, we are getting closer and closer and closer to the end time biblical Bible prophecies. And if you don't know what those prophecies are, maybe it's time for you to dig a little deeper in the Bible other than John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That way you can properly prepare yourself for the oncoming doom that it talks about pertaining to the judgments and the final judgments of God that will be befallen upon to this earth. I still blame Satan that has blinded humanity pertaining to our water table issues and our droughts and our atmosphere getting hotter at that it's related around what humanity has not done that should have done going all the way back 30 plus years ago. I don't know that we can make up for lost time. All, only thing I can say that we can try and go from there. But the damage has already done been done. And right now we are in a state like we have never been towards the damage that's And the United done. States are now discussing Iran's written response to what the EU policy chief calls his final text to revive the Iran nuclear deal. And while the reactions from the different parties are generally positive, a few sticking points remain. Tuesday on Connect the World, we heard from two key voices on this story. Russia's top diplomat in Vienna says reviving the deal is a collaborative effort. He expressed optimism that an agreement is near. The ball is now in the U.S. court. I hope that Washington will react positive, positively. And if it happens, uh, we will have uh, most likely a ministerial meeting of the Joint Commission of the JCPOA, either this week or next week. Indeed, we are very close to the final, very final stage. Well, the biggest potential sticking point, Iran's apparent demand for a guarantee of compensation if the U.S. withdraws from the deal again, as it did under former President Donald Trump in 2018. An Iranian expert in Tehran explained why the compensation issue is so important. Iran wants inherent guarantees where the United Iranians would be able to restart their enrichment program uh, to become like what it was before the deal very swiftly so that the United States will have an incentive to remain in the deal. The, the reason why the Iranians want it to be costly for the United States to leave the deal is because the Iranians want the deal to be protected. It's for the good of the deal for all sides who want to remain inside. For more perspective on this, I'm joined by Ellie Jeremiah. She's the deputy director of the Middle East and North Africa program. And that's understandable because there are so many needs that does need to be accommodated in that area pertaining to uh, nuclear energy, of uh, being able to bring electricity to various people. But the next question is, can we trust them? Because we know who their enemy truly is, which is our ally. Can we trust them? That's questionable. Washington, there is a clear pathway that the European Union has put forward after, as you said, months of hard slog diplomacy. And they sense, the European sense, is that they've now exhausted all avenues for compromise. Now, we're in a situation where everybody is saying that we are closer than we've ever been to getting the US and Iran to agree on how they would come back into full compliance with this agreement. But what we've seen is that they are somewhat shackled by the policies of the Trump administration that did its best to... See, in reality, picking between the lesser of the two evils, Obama actually had the right concept towards going over there and monitoring their successes in the... Uh, nuclear energy field 
That way we could keep an eye on the things that they was involved in and what that they was doing. But yet, no, there could always be that underhandedly decision to be made towards, well, now that we've gone this far, let's go the rest of the way towards creating a bomb. So it, it's based around trust pertaining to these issues, and it's also based around Bible prophecy of, of the degree towards what's going to occur in that particular region. During the last round of negotiations uh, uh, for the Iran nuclear deal, Iran does want to guarantee that the U.S. won't pull out again, but with a guarantee highly unlikely, will we see any other compromise that might satisfy part of that demand? What I think is that we've seen since March when really we hit a roadblock in these talks, and remember back in February, March, we thought we were very close to getting the deal done again, like today. What's happened since then is that um, the discussions in Tehran have been very, very heated on this issue of whether it really meets Iran's national security interests to go in uh, to a deal with the United States uh, with what they perceive is a very weak uh, presidency in the U.S. that may be overtaken by a future Republican uh, administration. Now, Iran wants to hold on. Some elements, let's say, in Iran want to hold on to their leverage, as they view it, of these nuclear bargaining chips. And others think that actually it's worthwhile having a two-year breathing room on, on the economy. Now, That's a heck of a laundry list. Now, to try and reach this internal consensus, the camp inside Iran that wants this deal to happen has been pressing and pushing the U.S., for, let's say, measures that could make up or provide some sort of insurance policy for Iran for the very fact that this U.S. administration cannot guarantee that a different U.S. administration in the future will abide by the agreement. And we've seen this movie play out before, recently under President Trump. So Iran has been coming up with different sorts of steps and gestures that the U.S. administration could take to try and provide, let's say, this insurance policy or make it more costlier than it was previously for a future U.S. administration to leave. So and that, far, President Biden has found it very difficult to give on any of these issues. And that was uh, one key point we heard from... Let's uh, go forward right here real quick um, for conscientious time's sake. Let's look at this real quick. ...steps that would make it a bit more difficult or politically more costly for a future U.S. administration to leave. And some of those ideas that have already been... Uh, what they need is some sort of a global, international... parliament that would stick to its original agreements on making sure that things did in fact occur the way that they're supposed to occur on both sides to make this really work. And I don't know who's going to be governed who in regards to be trustworthy enough to put international global trust in these in this particular group or people or whatever you want to call it in regards to this. To the media are things to do for example with how much time companies would have to exit deals with Iran if a future U.S. administration reimposes sanctions or decides to leave the agreement. Um, Iran. Donald Trump really, really upset the apple cart, but in a way, Donald Trump done what he done that now is bringing more stringent, magnifying events onto the table towards looking at all the details and not just part of them. ...speeds apparently extended to a much longer period than they currently are under U.S. framework. And the U.S. has, has seemingly, um, you know, been open to extending those timelines. Now, whether they can meet in the middle is another question. Um, another area which Iran could perhaps look to, again, make it more costly for the U.S. to depart is by making it much more quicker for it to revamp its nuclear activities. Now, in 2015, Iran essentially packed up shop and, and you know, shipped out uh, its stockpile of uranium and dismantled its, um, its centrifuges. What Iran may be looking to is to keep some of this 
uh, as if these nuclear leverage more closer to home so that if a future U.S. president leaves it. The very centrifuges that they're talking about are the very ones that are now uh, being abused over in the Ukrainian area that once they get so hot they'll just be a total meltdown and then we're looking at a, a, a complete total catastrophe pertaining to their carelessness of that in which what has embarked up into that situation that the atomic uh, nuclear uh, parties should have been able to take better control of that particular region or that particular problem that as far as I'm concerned will be held to the full extent of the world's uh, national courts if that was to occur because what has occurred goes beyond the ethnic rules of safety and comprehension with the atomic nuclear age and that's a fact let's go forward right here a little bit go forward go forward go forward see what they got to say here now energy bills let's bring in anna stewart live from london and anna certainly right now uk dealing with higher inflation the highest out of all the g7 yeah it's not a, a title that the uk wants but the highest inflation of the g7 and it's been this way for some months but this latest figure actually really came as a shock it was above all the estimates from analysts i spoke to yesterday it was above the expectation even from the bank of england and we can show you that it's still very much an energy price story relating to the war in Ukraine and the sanctions on Russia and the big energy squeeze that Europe is feeling. And actually, you can see that gas prices, for instance, are up over 95% over the last 12 months. Electricity, 54%. You've got fuel like petrol there, up over 43%. But what was interesting, Linda, about this latest inflation data was the fact that it's also food. What we're seeing now is the delayed uh, increased input costs now impacting other categories. So the increased uh, energy prices and also some issues on labor shortages, pushing up the price of a pint of milk, a loaf of bread, a bag of flour. A pint of milk is 40% more expensive than it was a year ago. And this is going to put such a squeeze on households who are already having to contend with their energy bills going up by over $1,000 just over the last year. And it's likely to go up even further still. Now, this means that the lowest paid uh, households in the UK will certainly suffer the most. So the Institute of Fiscal Studies put out a report earlier this week, and it showed that from their expectations, people in the lowest quintile in terms of income will actually feel inflation at 18 percent in October. So things are certainly going to get worse before they get better. Linda. Mm. Tough times ahead. And it's Stuart Forrest in London. Thank you. Well, tonight, for our parting shots, a mega mission into outer space. NASA finally ready to launch its Artemis I rocket to fly around the moon. Engineers at the Kennedy Space Center have been testing it for months to prepare. And, of course, if that nuclear reactor does blow up over there in Ukraine, you can add probably another year in extension of the higher prices over in that area because of the contamination problems and probably instead of it only going up 18 to 20 percent will probably be more in the range of 30 to 35 to 40 percent in addition to their higher prices that it's going to cost to bring heat into their homes that way they'll keep from freezing to death in the winter time so you got one problem that is exacerbating another problem that is exacerbating another problem and like i said a while ago the Atomic Nuclear Energy uh, Administrations should have put their finger on that problem and really and truly made it a taboo uh, law that neither Russia or the Ukrainians could in fact embark upon to that violation. And now the thing is, it's spewing. It's it's you know it's not getting proper electricity towards keeping the reactors uh, cool, and because of it, we're looking at a potential possibility of a meltdown. And of course, if that happens, Vice President Donald Trump, you can take all your figures that you just got through watching and looking at, and multiplying them basically by two, twice as long for for the prices to stable back out, twice as high 
food twice as high, fuel twice as high, etc., etc. And that's just over that one event. If the war breaks out to the point that, that it turns into some sort of a nuclear engagement with bombs actually being distributed over in the U, uh, U, UN or, or other places like that, then you can intensify it times three and maybe even times four or five pertaining to the prices of not only the energy to keep warm, but also the price of few, few, uh, food. So we've got one calamity that is only enhancing or, or uh, multiplying another problem. And don't think for a second that these other countries that's not embarked up into that, that's going on in that area, won't be affected because they will. The, the trickle effect will go all the way down. Don't think that, that we're exempt. We live in a very, very small bowl right now pertaining to the world in the exchange that every country basically has to rely upon another country. And I just seen while uh, last night where um, Pakistan, that has been at war with another country over there for years and years and years, that basically hates one another's guts because of the sh water shortage and because of other problems pertaining to the food that they're actually talking about coming together towards instead of being enemies with one another towards being allies because united we stand divided we fall and I think that they can actually foresee that if they continue on this on this uh, rhetoric of uh, being at one another's throat that it's only going to intensify the problem even worse. Once more, this is based around the, the facts, no longer concept, but the facts that the homo sapiens on, upon to the planet is damaging the resources on the planet as well as the upper atmosphere. Being pushed out of Congress. Representative Liz Cheney's landslide loss. I don't want to hear this. This is politics and it's pertaining to uh, Wyoming and uh, She's made the right decision, or she's made her decision towards sticking to her guns against Donald Trump, and I don't blame her at all because I think what, what she has made a commitment towards is a very, very honorable, decent thing. She was a heck of a heck of a uh, uh, candidate uh, for the people there. And, you know, this is just old garbage, old garbage that we've done heard about Donald Trump, and here we go here now. Here we go. And with CNN, the blast hit a Russian air base earlier this month, destroying several planes and killing at least one person. The report also claims Ukraine was behind two other uh, sets of explosions at an ammunition facility and an airfield. As well, this comes as Ukraine says that Russian rockets slammed into a key area in southern Ukraine near the Black Sea. The attacks hit Odessa in the overnight hours, and Ukraine says at least four people were hurt. And just west of Ukraine's capital city, Russians launched another overnight attack on an airfield striking military and civilian buildings. CNN's senior international correspondent, uh, Dave McKenzie, joins us live. See, it's only, aggress it's only progressing. It's getting worse. It ain't getting better. And I don't know between the two of these two countries if they're actually going to throw the whole world off into chaos to the degree that there will be inevitably a third world war. And in the event of these occurrences, there will be millions upon millions upon millions of people's lives that will be affected in a negative way to the extent that it will probably bring death and destruction into a great deal of people. Some in some of in some countries more so than here in the Western world, but this is all targeting in the opposite direction of peace and utopia. This is all uh, part of the results or part of the um, consequences in that in which what didn't occur in 1988 after nine tapes went to Ronald Reagan and his administration in successfully succeeding by convincing the superpowers that the world was not going to end in a holocaust. As you can see, we are getting closer and closer to the doomsday holocaust of the very things that most of the western politicians over here feared that would occur that now looks inevitably 
uh, closer towards it occurring because of lack of leadership and because of the natural catastrophes pertaining to Mother Nature and also pertaining to the war over in Russia and Ukraine that's only bringing more instability to the world etc 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 so what I'm looking at is the failure to communicate because the American churches obviously here in America especially in this area that's called the Bible Belt area did not want to participate with the founder of the windmill ministries of him being part of the orchestrator to that particular ministry and now we have fallen prey uh, to not just drugs but overdoses and our schools being imitated by by uh, drug lords and and gun violence and our prisons being full and our, and our people's health failing pertaining to sicknesses and and thirty trillion dollars in debt and I could go on and on and on with the illegal immigrants uh, on and on and on this is their fault not the founder of the windmill ministries I've been doing my part by putting out the information to the general public, but nobody wants to back me or support me or get in my corner. And because of it, I'm seeing things steadily, steadily unwinding. I'm seeing things steadily, steadily going backwards. I'm seeing things steadily, steadily going in the opposite direction of peace and utopia. But at the same time, I'm still seeing no positive response. Nobody's knocking on my door. Nobody's calling me. Nobody's sending me emails or, or, or texting me towards, hey, Juby, we, we're in behind you. We want to support you. Uh, yes, we uh, we do believe in the things that you believe in, and, and we want to be there to help to get your message out to the general public. After 30-some-odd years, I'm still not seeing positive results in these areas. And to be quite honest with you, uh, I just recently had another encounter with uh, a church group that I originally made a conscious choice of in the early 2000s, which was 20 plus years ago, towards getting involved with a group of people in Jackson, Tennessee, while I lived and worked there for 10 years called the Lighthouse Pentecostal Church. Uh, re, uh, since since then, that church, I think, got hit by a tornado or burnt or something. It got destroyed, and they had to relocate. But whenever I come back to Northwest Tennessee in 2014, which was eight years ago, I had such of a rumble with the pre-existing United Pentecostal Church movement in Jackson, Tennessee, that they basically banded me from ever coming back to that building or that church. Nobody got in any type of, of controversial argument. There was no fight. There was nobody that basically got nasty or ugly with one another. But yet in all, the very church that I joined which was the Lighthouse Pentecostal Church. My wife and I joined um, in the early 2000s. Now I'm not welcome to attend or go back to. That's one of the reasons why that I had so much empathy and sympathy for the church up here in Union City, Tennessee, pertaining to the United Pentecostal Church because Brother Calum, that's the minister there, that come from California. I think he's been here about 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. He's having problems right now with his mother up in St. Louis. If you don't mind, keep him in prayer. I know I do, because I love him in the Lord, and I love certain members out there in the Lord. But yet, no, I tried to give them a go, a go at it after that I got banded from Central Baptist Church because of the mayor of Martin, Randy Brundridge that basically uh, told me that I was not welcome there because I had a different belief than they did and 
And, you know, it's not the belief, because I believe in the very same things that they believe in, which no man can be saved other than through the Son, which is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the only begotten. I don't know where they come up with the fact that my belief is different than their belief, other than me believing in the end time events towards it unfolding, maybe a little bit differently than the movie The Day After. And so many people in the Western world here, over in the United States, fell into that entrapment pertaining to the rapture theory, to where everybody was just going to vanish or disappear, you was going to have all this chaos, airplanes was going to be falling out of the sky, buses was going to be uh, hitting in, in major accidents, people were just going to disappear, parents was going to be looking for their children and couldn't find them, uh, just total chaos. There will be total chaos of the opening of the second seal, and there will be total chaos in between the second opening of the seal and the third seal, where it says, See thou hurt not the oil nor the wine, whenever God will come back in, in great flame and fire, uh, collecting uh, the elect from the four corners of the earth. At the same time, during that time, the angels of God will be ordered not not to destroy uh, the greenery pertaining to the foliage and also have had been ordered not to destroy the oil uh, the contents of the oil which is in the ground so see thou hurt not the ground or the vegetation but everything else burned to the ground that's during the time that that the Lord himself not me but God and God's son will open that third seal which is that third horse the black horse that talks about he or she it don't indicate which will have a pair of balances in their hands indicating that something will be close because if you really get to looking at what those balances represented to begin with of a weighing scale it was actually weighing the closeness of something that's the reason why it talks about in between the opening of the second seal and the third seal, a penny for a barley, a three barleys for a penny, pertaining to weighing out the measures in regards towards those who have done good will be rewarded for the good, and those who have done evil will get the rewards of the evil at that time. That will be whenever the false prophet will come into power of the black horseman. Once more, I don't know if it's going to be a male or female, but I know that that her or his story will be close and being accurate. Uh, the people will fall in line towards wanting to support this particular person. Okay. And that will be the false prophet that within a 42 month period, somewhere right around 42 months, three and a half years according to the Bible, that's whenever it will be identified towards what it had done towards mysteriously uh, jeopardizing the safety and the well-being of the homo sapiens upon to the planet that will also be whenever Jesus Christ himself will open the fourth seal and in that term or in that period of time that will be whenever the new world order monetary system will come into play because everything else will be burnt down to the ground they'll basically have to start from scratch towards communications and housing and in the meantime total chaos will be here upon to the planet cannibalism will be predominant uh, death disease uh, people freezing to death people uh, not having proper medications people dying because it's too hot people dying because it's too cold people dying because there ain't enough uh, uh, food because if, if the sun is darkened with all the, all the uh, smoke uh, of all the homes and, the, and the businesses being burnt down to the ground goes up into the atmosphere uh, the agriculture communities will suffer tremendously towards not being able to grow proper crops because you got to have sunlight and water to grow a good crop to have a good yield so the agriculture communities will be strained during this time and that's whenever the, the fourth seal that no one can open other than the lamb will be open once more we're talking about end time biblical Bible prophecy events that obviously Randy Brundridge and the people in Central Baptist Church have not bothered to study and identify these things and whenever the fourth seal is open that will basically be the mark 666 that will come into play towards people 
that are still living upon to the planet during the time of great, great remorse and suffering that this particular new monetary system, the new world order, will come into play and if you do not accept the mark 666, you will either starve to death or at that point in time you will be beheaded. Now, I'm going to say something that is going to be contrary to most people's beliefs that is probably going to sound unhumane. But the people that actually come to a quick and sudden death during the time of the opening of the fourth horseman, the fourth seal, they will be the ones that will be blessed. They will be the ones that won't have to go it's through excruciating suffering and cruelty it's those that are left after that 42 months that have accepted that mark 666 then is whenever things will become so highly erratical that will go beyond anybody's imagination of the things that we're currently adapted to today and basically the planet earth will turn into a living, burning, festering hell. People at that point in time will want to die. They'll finally realize that all this stuff that these crazy Christians has been talking about is in fact true. They'll want to die, but according to the Bible, they won't be able to die. That's where your zombie apocalypse comes in at towards shooting people, beheading people, um, stabbing people, and they won't be able to die. Because the Bible says that they cried and cried and cried for the rocks to fall up onto them, and the rocks fell not. In other words, during that thousand year millennium, there will be untold cruel suffering such as humanity has never, ever, ever, or ever will experience again. That will be the beginning phases of the end of the world. Once more, I did not write the book of Revelations. I did not write the Gospels. I did not write the book of Daniel. I did not write the things coming out of Isaiah uh, in regards towards the things that has been pre-selected or predicted to happen in these end time events. Uh, you can look uh, at some of the things in the Old Testament that very well support the things in the New Testament pertaining to uh, the old uh, Persian Empire, of how the old Persian Empire to this day is still trying to merge, uh, pertaining to Elam, which is basically Iran. Uh, talks about the bow, the bow being powerful, military strength, for he had a bow. Uh, talks about that in the first first uh, two chapters of chapter 6 pertaining to the opening of the first horse um, talks about this uh, in a, is, is, is Ezekiel uh, chapter 1 verse 23 it talks about uh, Malak uh, Rita and uh, uh, Isaiah the 25th chapter um, over into other occurrences pertaining to um, pertaining to the wrath of God that's going to be befallen upon to the planet um, and other prophecies events over in Isaiah 8 and 18 Malak um, etc etc but once more if you haven't studied these things and if you hadn't put your mind to these things so many of the Christians around here that claim that that they're in the Bible Belt area and that they're saved you know they mean well they really do they really mean well and they focus their attention solely upon John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and there's nothing wrong with that if you want to be a simple-minded person to live a simple-minded life and you don't want to get into the innermost deeper parts of prophecy I think that you'll be fine with your salvation 
as long as you continue your own salvation and your works is good, I think that you'll be fine. You don't have to understand the things in, on a global perspective just to be able to make it into the kingdom of God. But at the same time, the people that is not heavily adapted to this doctrine of end time events, they should not ridicule or try to persecute or demonize or dehumanize those that are. That's the part that I've been dealing with now for the past 30 plus years that has driven the Western world off into where we are to this day and still to this day as far as the United Pentecostal headquarters I still do not believe that it has been addressed properly that I extended my hand to a brother Brown that at that time was the minister of the Lighthouse Pentecostal Church that eventually once the building got destroyed and he got into another position towards being the, the Tennessee director of the United Pentecostal uh, Association here in the state of Tennessee. Um, yes, he did apologize to me towards the occurrences that, that took place, but there was never a true clarity of of uh, clarity of closure towards the very perpetrator that started all of that, which was his son Richard, that now is holding a church somewhere down in, in uh, L.A. County or pretty close to L.A. in regards towards what manifested all that to begin with. Because at that time, in the year 2000, when her, my wife walked out of my life and me and her was having marital problems and then we got back together, that was during the time of all the rejection here in Northwest Tennessee against the Windmill Ministries missions. In addition to the resistance that I got prior to the year 2000, going all the way back into 1989, of various resistant movements, groups of people, solely the churches, that stood up once more against this message. Because they didn't like the message, they took it out on the messenger. Why did they take it out on the messenger? They took it out on the messenger because the messenger was a lone wolf. The messenger had stepped out on his own. The messenger did not have a Joe Osteen congregation in behind him with a 40 plus thousand supporters. So that in and of itself left me to be vulnerable towards all these other different law enforcement agencies as well as so-called churches to use me basically as a battering ram, to use me basically as a whipping post. And even whenever I come back to Northwest Tennessee in 20 and 17, the proof is in the pudding in the regards towards how that they was blaming me because of the things that they didn't do in regards towards peace and utopia. To just give you some sort of an ideal how blasphemy that the Homo Sapien Society is, not only did they resist the message coming from the messenger, but then they wanted to turn it around towards acting like that I was the Antichrist, I was the devil, I was the monster, and that it, it was my fault that things has turned out to be so sorry the way that they have 30 plus years after I first started with the message of the first seal and the Bible being opened. In addition to John 3.16 and in addition to all the other biblical Bible prophecies. It's not my fault, first of all, that my message was rejected. It's not my fault that they didn't have enough sense to interpret the Bible correctly. It's not my fault that they didn't catch it pertaining to the young boy, the young lad that had these powers uh, that could bring fire out of heaven, kill flying objects out of the sky, and basically raise the dead that was doing all these occurrences in the name of evil versus in the name of holiness. It's not my fault that they did not catch on towards there will be a Luciferian Lucifer in the flesh pertaining to Satan that in his growing up 
had a red horse. In my growing up, I had a white horse. I was given a crown, which was a supernatural crown, the very same crown of thorns that was placed upon Jesus Christ's head, and he went forth conquering and to conquer because he had a bow. He had a bow, past tensively speaking, pertaining to the bow that's on my second oldest brother's headstone to this day that my father had that he uh, carelessly got rid of even though it was a family heirloom. He had a bow, maybe pertaining to a promise, pertaining to the rainbow because the rainbow has always been considered since the great flood as being a promise or the bow is also looked upon as being a sense of strength, either military strength or supernatural spiritual strength. For he had a bow. He was given a crown, and he went forth conquering. Now, how am I going to conquer? Like I am right now. By the people that get a hold of this message and listen to me and take it for face value in that in which what I am telling them towards it being the truth. The truth in, 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 in uh, how that God has gifted me in the formal as well as the informal way of, of, uh, of interpreting the Bible in these end time events that is going to occur. In the meantime, as the letters of the red in Jesus' teaching said that he would take away the blessings of one nation and give it to another nation that was bearing forth the fruits thereof. The only reason why that God hadn't already done brought condemnation, complete condemnation to this country like he has in other parts of the world, India, Africa, uh, over in the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, etc., etc., is because there was a sense of holiness here in the United States. We have sent out more ambassadors and more evangelists and done more for other countries that have had calamities than any other country in the world. And that's really the only reason why that we haven't been already engaged in some sort of a complete total disaster in bringing America down. And you may be thinking, well, we just got through with a disaster pertaining to COVID. Yeah, that was only part of it. We just got through going through disasters pertaining to floods, floods and famines. Yeah, that's part of it. But we're also going to go through more if the people in the United States does not resubmit, just like the Bible talks about in the first four chapters of Revelations, and go back and do thy first works over again. If you're not willing to do that, then you're going to see more harm more hurt, more anguish, not just in other countries, but right here in the good old United States of America. And that was that was the very things that I was trying to prevent from happening. Just like just like one of the events uh, that I'm looking at right now towards a possible another meltdown, uh, similar to the uh, Genova uh, thing or the thing that happened up here, here towards New York, um, towards that meltdown, and there's been other close encounters of nuclear. Um, nuclear problems in the world other than just those two but uh, the point being is that we are going in the opposite direction of peace and utopia we are going in the opposite direction towards the fulfillment of Bible prophecy towards being united rather than being divided and as I continue to make more and more videos social media platform videos I get ignored that much more. So I, I'm just wondering how far is too far? How far are we going to go before people start waking up and realizing that it was the older society pertaining to the baby boomers and those that rejected this message that has put us where we are today? It don't have nothing to do with the messenger. It's got to do with how the, the so-called church communities did not want to support the individual and basically uh, throwed him to the wolves. Hung out on a limb. That's what they done. Because I truly believe that in the year 2000, after me going through 10 years of abrupt rejection, negativity, 
especially with the church world society or the so-called church world society, that if I would have had that 40,000 Joe Osteen crowd, I wouldn't have been subjected to the things that happened to me in Martin, Tennessee, towards being charged with falsifying files. I wouldn't have been subjected on three different levels, on three different times pertaining to the Kentuckians up around Land Between the Lakes, especially around the Kentucky Dam. I wouldn't have been subjected to Homeland Security towards what happened in 2005 whenever I was up in Nashville, Tennessee by sending the 43rd President George Bush uh, a t-shirt by explaining to him about the Juby story and a bloody road ahead. I wouldn't have had to have gone through all them other different skirmishes, like the skirmishes out either in Oklahoma or the skirmishes whenever I come back here in 20 and 14 in Northwest Tennessee, or even some of the uh, skirmishes that happened in 2007 uh, up in Atlanta, Georgia, with basically GBI. I wouldn't have had to have went through any of those events if the church society did not make a deaf ear or, or a blinded eye in regards to the things that I was telling them about going all the way back into 1983 of the poison arrow that struck the flesh of my skin that before it hit me I would absolutely vanish or disappear that every molecule in my body would be changed from mortal to immortal in a twinkling of an eye and that the rest of us would be also changed and we would go to heaven and live hereafter after with the Lord Jesus Christ in New Jerusalem, a new heaven. If people would have paid more attention to the things that the messenger was putting out there, even though they didn't like the message, I truly believe to this day we would not be staring down the barrels of possibly another nuclear catastrophe over in Ukraine that I really don't know if the Ukrainians done it intentionally to sabotage the Russians. That's what they're saying it happened. Or it was the Russians. You know, whenever you got uh, whenever you got information that is contrary to the facts, and then it all gets spread out there in front of you, you, you kind of debate on who exactly that you want to point the finger towards, other than the fact that the Atomic Nuclear Administration age did not intervene in that situation to the point that it's now growing on the intensity that it's growing. So let's go back to what they're talking about here. We, we have changed channels, and this is also regarding uh, climate, the climate deniers as well as other things that are going on worldwide. Please watch. Does it cost so much to investigate those crimes? David Ferenthold, it was an eye-opening uh, article. I, I recommend it to people. Thank you so much for being on the program. New water restrictions on the way for drought-stricken states like Arizona, Nevada, right here in Wyoming as well. What those restrictions look like and what the newly signed climate and health law will do about it, that's ahead. You're watching a special edition of Chris Chanting Reports live from Cheyenne. Which leads me to another conversation that I recently had this morning with an investigator here in the state of Tennessee um, pertaining to Lake Mead there on the Colorado River side uh, there in front of the Hoover Dam. I didn't realize how big that that lake was in addition to the rest of the body of the of the river that basically flows there but I didn't realize that that lake was almost, it, it's within 20,000 acres as being as big as land between the lakes up in, that basically begins in Dover, Tennessee, and goes all the way to uh, Grand Rivers, Kentucky, which is, I guess, what, 50, 60 miles long, uh, 11, 12, 15 miles wide. I didn't realize that that lake that they're talking about, Lake Mead, is actually that big. Wyoming is in a race against the clock to cut water use as seven other surrounding states prepare for cuts as well because of an ongoing drought. The drought has been shrinking the Colorado River and its surrounding reservoirs to perilously low levels. Here's CNBC's Valerie Castro. Look at that. Unprecedented cutbacks to water use from the Colorado River will hit Arizona and Nevada the hardest as drought continues to scorch the southwest. 
40 million people across seven states rely on the water. Millions more rely on power it generates through the Hoover Dam at Lake Mead and the Glen Canyon Dam at Lake Powell. But years of using up the reservoir supplies are now reaching a critical point. We just kept spending out of the bank account and saying, this is great, we can keep spending. But we never rebuilt the bank account. We never rebuilt the balance. And now there's no alternative but to call for very large cuts and reductions because there's no more money in the bank account. Jack Schmidt, director of the Center for Colorado River Studies, says the basin states haven't come to an agreement on their own, while Lake Mead levels have reached a new low, triggering the federally mandated cuts. Some of the states have tried to say, we think it's a really important problem and those other guys need to fix it and stop spending. And other states are saying, well, we were willing to cut more, but we'll be damned if we're going to cut more if no one else is going to cut at all. Everybody has to tighten their belts in this situation. The new cuts will force Nevada to reduce usage by 8 percent. Arizona will cut back by 21 percent. The impact hitting the state's farmers already working with less water. They're trying to do what they can to reduce, still have production, not fallow lands, but uh, stay in operation to meet the consumer demand. That was CNBC's Valerie Castro. President Biden's signing of that massive climate and health care package yesterday is about as timely as you can get because it includes $4 billion in drought relief for the rivers and its reservoir. But once more, let's get this straight. What he done yesterday by signing that was a good thing. That was a good thing. But it should have been signed 30 plus years ago. And if you don't believe me, get on the phone or contact Al Gore up in Nashville, Tennessee and ask him the very same question. In other words, not only was our leaders, our professionals, our experts not paying close enough attention to the atmosphere becoming very, very hot above us because of the carbon dioxide going up into the air, but as the planet is getting hotter underneath our feet, it's causing more evaporation, and the evaporation is causing less snowfall, and the evac uh, in the uh, uh, event of, no, of not as much snowfall, you're having the event towards these massive, massive weather, uh, uh, weather related events, global natural catastrophes events that is only intensifying rather than getting better. And also, she didn't bring it to your awareness a while ago. If you look at those stricken states that they're talking about out west that are going to be in dire need, uh, the, the, the pattern that we're on right now in the next couple of years, a few years from now, going to be in dire need. It's also affecting the underground water channels. And one of those water channels, I think they call it aquadors, that starts basically in Kansas somewhere and goes down. I guess maybe it's connecting to uh, the Colorado River some way or another, maybe the Missouri River, I don't know. But it's an aquador that's basically going dry down through Oklahoma and down through Texas. So whenever you look at what you're looking at as far as the weather, the water table being exacerbatedly low like it ought to be, you need to also think about the other things that are also going to be suffering and the aqua doors underneath our feet is one of them. I'm going to go as far as to say I don't know this for sure. I've spoken to professional aqua door people that basically are experts in drilling wells and they know what's underneath our ground. They know how the aquador systems, basically taverns, cab caverns and stuff that goes up underneath the ground. Uh, I'm going to say that it's a good possibility that we gain a great deal of water intensifyingness off of the mighty Mississippi because of various cracks and various caves and various uh, cavities that's 
either on the bottom of the Mississippi or on the side of the Mississippi that helps to keep our aqua doors full around in this area. But even there has been a couple times um, where it has gotten so hot and so dry here, especially up in eastern Kentucky, up in the mountain range, up in the Appalachians, they call it the Smoky Mountains, there has been several, several wells that has went dry in several different events because of the massive dryness and the heat that has dried up a lot of their creeks and streams and whenever the creeks and streams ain't running the creeks and streams ain't filling up the aqua doors whenever the aqua doors start getting low that's whenever people's wells either start drying up or they have to bring in another well guy out there to dig a deeper well just to be able to get fresh water out of their wells so one problem exacerbates the other problem and we're just now beginning to see that after the signing of a massive climate correction bill that has now come into law as of yesterday which has been a needful needful um, eye-opener event that should have taken place whenever especially whenever Al Gore run for president which was right around 2000. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, these events should have happened even back in the late 80s, early 90s. But because we was blinded by the devil, uh, because we were still blaming everything on God, and because we didn't realize that the things that we're doing to our planet is also affecting our upper atmosphere by either not having no rains or having too much rains that come down too, too hard and too quick, in other words, it it has added uh, it has added instability to our ecosystem, not just here in America, but also in other places all over the world. And we're just now coming in into agreement about those things. That even whenever Mr. Biden signed that bill, there was not one. Republican, not one, that voted in for this to occur. Now, if you want to know who the people are in left field, if you want to know who the climate deniers are, beginning with Donald Trump, if you want to know who has gotten us in this fix that we're all in, beginning with the Reagans and the Bushes in the late 80s, early 90s, if you want to know the truth, you got to go back to the core of origin whenever we took a left-hand turn, or our government did, versus a right. That's what has started all this, that has put us where we are to this day. And, and you know what really, um, I, guess, I guess we're dealing with people that's incapable of being able to see the whole truth versus only bits and pieces or parts of the truth. To this day, we still have people that are blinded that can't see the trees for the forest and they blame the current administration that's in power now. Well, do you not think that, that every administration since the Reagan administration has steadily been going backwards? I mean, you can look at the proof. The proof is in the pudding pertaining to the record of Lake Mead that has not been at its natural uh, water pool state going back since I think 1983. And if you look at other water tables that has not been at their full capacity out west, you will go back to 1983. If you look at other water tables in Europe and rivers and things going on, you'll go back to 1983. You'll go back to whenever those two hands miraculously come out of heaven that saved my life, that two weeks after that my doctor committed suicide, and two weeks after that my, my own biological father tried to finish me off. I try to tell people in educating people pertaining to these issues. I try to educate people pertaining to the harshness of, of war-stricken uh, psychiatric uh, problems. You know, my father was one of the world's worst in going around telling the community that I had one son on the bottle and one son on the Bible. Okay? And and because both of them was considered um, 
was considered basically of being overbearing is the way that he would would basically uh, pronounce it. He seen both of us being in the category of destruction. And the reason why I know this is because I asked my dad one time, I said, well, tell me this, which one's the worst? The one on the bottom, your oldest son, it's on the, on the bottle, or your third oldest son, the youngest son, next to the youngest son, being on the Bible. He said they're both bad. And that was his mindset. 30 plus years ago, whenever I first got touched by God in distributing out this message, he looked at me as me being a Bible thumper or a religious fanatic. And believe it or not, he treated his, his firstborn son, Danny, my older brother, he treated him with more compassion in ways than he did me because maybe it was his firstborn, I don't know. Maybe he had compassion on his older son because he felt like maybe it was his influences that helped to drive him off into that area. Maybe it was because his whole family basically had an alcohol problem. Uh, not just one, but the two brothers as well as the sister. They all had some sort of problems with, with wanting to drink or do stuff. So I don't know why he was more compassionate with his older son other than the fact that he was other than the fact that James Robert Jackson had more empathy and sympathy for the alcoholics than he did somebody such as myself that he classified as being a Bible fanatic. Well, you know what? God is the one that instilled those desires in me towards me wanting to know more and more and more and more and more, not only about past tensively history, but also about present and future history in regards towards biblical Bible prophecy. Not only did I get punished by my father that walked around embarrassing his family, but the very person that my father was was uh, uh, wanting to lean towards myself in being psychologically, emotionally, chemically imbalanced, that the very person that was doing the point finger pointing of being that way of accusing his son of being that way was himself being that way. And the vast majority of the people in this community within a 25 mile radius, anywhere in the direction that you want to go, note it. He not only was violent, but he was unstable in all his ways. Um, you never knew from one hour to the another or one day to the other of whenever you met James Robert Jackson, of what kind of mood that he was going to be in. And most of the time he did treat the public with a whole, whole lot more respect than he ever thought about his family. And the reason for this, I think, is because he had enough sense to realize that he wasn't going to get away with screaming and yelling and being violent with people like he was his family. And because of it, he was more ordinarily more professional or more graceful with the general public than he was with his family. He basically used his family as his own personal whipping post. Why did he do this other than the fact that he was in World War II and he had post-traumatic stress disorder? I believe it was because he walked away from God right down here in Alamo Baptist Church whenever the man got about halfway down to the altar and decided to go back and sit down and within a matter of a few weeks or months, my mother and him both quit going to church, and that's whenever they went backwards, and the Bible says that it would have been better for you to have never known the ways of righteousness than for you to turn from that lifestyle. And the reason for this, according to the Bible, it says that it leaves room in a person's heart to be seven times more wickeder on the last than they ever thought about how bad it was on the front end. Why is that? Why is that, one may ask. Well, I believe that whenever one gets saved, their whole demeanor changes. I believe in order to be born again, that you're basically your heart goes through a transformation period and it actually grows. It gets bigger. And because your knowledge is greater, because your expansion of various organs has grown, uh, you become supposedly more in tune with God 
towards maturity that whenever you turn from God the Bible says to whom much is given much is required well whenever you turn from God knowing God that's whenever you become seven times more meaner seven times more hard headed seven times more uh, unreasonable to deal with and those was the characteristics that we was dealing with James Robert Jackson basically up until his death and it wasn't until he made a bedside confession with a priest and acknowledging uh, whenever the Holy Father was there praying for him oh, uh, that take, basically took his whole body and wrapped it around my my father's body uh, with the Bible on top of my uh, uh, biological father's chest that up until then for four or five hours he had been totally incoherent and according to my brother his head turned like he uh, acknowledged everybody in the room but he never opened up his eyes and and he picked up his right hand up towards the priest's chest and up towards the priest's Bible and within a matter of minutes that's whenever his vital signs went crazy and he become deceased I wasn't there that day so I can't I can't verify that that I actually witnessed that, but according to my son, and uh, my ex-wife was there, her daughter was there, Amanda, according to their testimony, that's what happened to James Robert Jackson. We are almost a day late and a dollar short in regards towards Mr. President Biden signing this massive before we go, there's some Bill. business we have to tend to. Monkey business. It all began with a mysterious 911 call to deputies in San Luis Obispo, California, from an unlikely location, the zoo. Well, the sheriff now thinks this small simian named Root was apparently having an otherwise uneventful Saturday night when she decided to monkey around. They posted on Facebook that she must have picked up the zoo's cell phone, which was in the zoo's golf cart, and just so happened to dial 911 and most likely a banana emergency. But hey, they were told that Capuchin monkeys like Root are very inquisitive and will grab anything and everything and just start pushing buttons. At the end of the day, they say you can't really blame her. Monkey see, monkey do. Well, this has been more fun than a barrel of monkeys. And now I've exhausted every monkey idiom I know, so I'll say that does it for us this hour. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Chris Jansing Reports. A big thank you to the team here on the ground in Wyoming. Join us for Chris Jansing Reports every weekday, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, right here on MSNBC. Katie Tour Reports starts next. And it's good we as mortals, the homo sapiens up onto the planet, can take a little bit of the good in with the bad to have a bit of humor in regards towards all these issues. Thanks again for listening. Good luck to all of us in regards towards these major, major influential influences that are influencing people's lives. I hate it uh, for ground zero pertaining to the bureaus uh, that is in play towards protecting and taking care of the American people's lives, that they are being attacked right now pertaining to the problems that Donald J. Trump has stirred up here in America that's still being a climate denier and is still stirring up strife here in America towards basically being a rebel riser that could actually lead into more severe problems in not only here in America but throughout the world. We want to thank you for, uh, for being a part of the Windmill Ministries and us fixing to close here. I want I do want to see this one other article that was shown on the Hoover Dam. I'm pretty sure it's going to be probably repeating itself, but just in case there's some more information about the the uh, climate changes and and, and uh, Lake Mead and and the and the things going on, I would like to be able to uh, fine tune a little bit closer on into that because they claim that once Lake Mead, which is the Colorado River, gets below Lake Pool that it will no longer be able to generate electricity from the Hoover Dam. In other words, the dam will be there, but it will basically be a, a, a worthless a design, a worthless piece of material uh, that 
costed ain't no telling us how much and men's lives that got damaged and hurt building the dam that basically it will no longer be effective in doing what it's supposed to be doing. So I would like to be able to see this last sector towards what they're actually discussing about the Hoover Dam. I've seen a picture of the Hoover Dam and I'm pretty sure it's probably going to go back to weather related problems pertaining to uh, global warming in regards towards the consequences now that we're all looking at and seeing other than just the professionals are the uh, the smart people. A pregnant and parentless 16 year old in Florida may be forced to give birth after an appeals court ruled she was not sufficiently mature to decide whether to terminate her pregnancy as NBC News reports. It okay it looks like they're gonna put something else in front of that I don't know what they're gonna uh, what they're going to talk about but like I said a while ago if the water table in the Colorado River which is based around uh, moisture content falling from the sky regardless whether it falls in the summertime or the wintertime pertaining to great snows that helps to keep that Colorado River full that once that river gets below poo the generators that are creating electricity because of the flow of water will basically cease to exist and then the dam itself will no longer be generating electricity to millions and millions and millions of people. It's really sad that, that we have just now awakened to the urgency of this problem. You know, we want to stay focused on this problem or that problem, or we want to try to send people to other parts of the universe, supposedly looking for life. We want to do this, we want to do that. But I guarantee you, if this is going in the direction like it's going in towards not being changed in the next two to five years from now pertaining to the water issues out west here in America, it's going to become everybody's problem. Because they'll have to dismantle a great deal of people that will have to move in other areas of the United States if they're going to continue to live. Because you got to have water and you got to have electricity to live off of. And if you don't have neither, you're not going to live too long. But there's other water source uh, supplies out in Arizona and other areas that are suffering immensely too. Along with the underground uh, aquadors. And this thing is heading in the very opposite direction of peace and utopia that I was hoping that the church communities would have gotten on board with and obviously they didn't not only did they not do it then but obviously they're not doing it now um, I felt like that maybe uh, the United Pentecostal Church since they have invested so much in me and I've invested so much in them and that they knew my past they knew the history of my past going all the way back to the Lighthouse Pentecostal Church I was hoping that that group of people would have opened up with me towards somebody coming to me and saying, you know what, Dennis, a mistake was made 20-something years ago with the Lighthouse Pentecostal Church. We would like to pick up where that left off in supporting you in your endeavors uh, pertaining to you being the messenger of this message. Even though we don't like the message, uh, we would like to be able to uh, stand in your corner with you. I never got nobody to, to come to me with those, with those opinions or with those avenues those concerns and because of it uh, rather than me throw good money to bad rather than me continue to waste time kind of like a dog chasing after its tail that's moving but it ain't going nowhere I decided to back once more away from the United Pentecostal Church in Union City now that doesn't mean that I don't still love them it doesn't mean that I don't still pray for them because I do and everything is based around, and I continue to remember this again and again and again, it's based upon the few words that Jesus Christ said in his final words as hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do unto others. Do unto others. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Okay? I cannot judge people in the regards towards their ignorances of the things that they should be aware of that obviously they did not want to be aware of or they maybe was incapable of being aware of. I cannot judge people because of their ignorances. 
But I do know somebody that came. And his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he's going to be the ultimate judge above and beyond all the judges towards identifying, towards who was sincere and who was not sincere, who truly believed in the Lord and who, who only said that they believed in the Lord, which is going to end on this final note. As I was talking to the individual this morning about various passages, about various interpretations of the Bible, he spoke up about how that he felt like that people that become martyrs for Christ are those that has had a not just a true relationship with Christ, but have actually seen or been around or experienced Christ in their presence. And maybe to some degree, maybe right. But that still does not ignore the fact how come people was willing to walk for miles and miles and miles wearing sandals in a hot blazing sand that um, that basically uh, walked just to be able to share the gospel with, with the various people around them in their communities or their villages towards telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ until their feet bled, until great sores come up onto their body towards wanting to make sure that if you never had an opportunity of accepting Christ of a hereafter life beyond this life, that now maybe that information that they was given to those people, even though they had to sacrifice so much to get it there to them, that they would take heed to the messages. So are you telling me that the people that have suffered immensely, that they have genuinely being the being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ to some degree I go along with that but the bottom line is this if you are not sincere with the Heavenly Father don't expect the Heavenly Father to be sincere with you the Father seeketh those according to the Bible to worship him in truth and in spirit and if you're not worshiping the Heavenly Father in truth and in spirit odds are your devotion to him is probably not real. It's probably in vain. And I don't think it's necessarily got to do with a person having to be exposed in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ towards either seeing, feeling, or hearing Christ, but I think it's got to do with the sincerity of that individual in being a martyr or wanting to be a martyr for Christ in how sincere and how predominant that they are with the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt we're all unintentionally going to make mistakes. We're all unintentionally uh, occasionally going to going to be distracted. We're occasionally going to win a battle or two pertaining to the temptations of the flesh. Uh, there, you know, that doesn't mean that you're not sincere. It just means that you got caught unaware and that now you got to go back to the cross and get things right again with God and try to become more obviously um, mature in the Lord and serving the Lord. To me, each day is almost like a new world. You wake up, you got new factors, you got new information, you supposedly have evolved as far as knowledge, you have matured pertaining to your intellect, and if you're not doing that on a day-to-day -day basis, I tend to wonder once more if you have truly, genuinely been saved. It's not so much pertaining to the individual that has been in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ towards wanting to make themselves martyrs. Because by and large, Jesus does not present himself in front of people that way. By and large. But it's the pure mere fact that you've been in the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you was very, very humbly sincere with your relationship with God, and because of it, yes, you have basically become a sacrificial um, entity for the love and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and you would actually uh, give your life for the Lord the same way that the Lord gave his life to you 
And it's not that you're fearless, because we all have a certain fear pertaining to staring at death. Um, it's just that our love and our drive for Christ exceeds that fear to the point that we get out and we we become uh, on the front lines with the Lord. Thank you. And a new climate report warns of the devastation that would hit California when the big one, you've heard it before, the big one finally comes. But interestingly, the report is not talking about earthquakes or an earthquake. And the latest from Atlanta, where Rudy Giuliani just... Unbelievable. co-wrote a Brookings Institution report called Fulton County, Georgia's Trump investigation. So Blaine, um, as I understood it yesterday, you said you... Let's see if I bypass that, that one message about California. And it looks like I But have. it's treatable. And because of it, we're going to end. For conscientious sake, for time's sake, we're going to end. And we want to thank all of you all for... And it uh, comes amid skyrocketing energy as well as fuel prices. For Gas your loyalty and listening to this program, thank you very much. percent in the last year, and the cost of milk and bread continues to soar. All of this, of course, hitting ordinary Brits. God bless you. God Australia. bless America. Not, no, I here with me to discuss. God bless America's I endeavors. Start with you, I mean, what's why? And shalom. Patient compared to the rest of you seven, I wanted to ask you: Is Brexit? Got anything to do with this? It's an interesting one. It's certainly not a title the UK would like, and it's one that's been chained yeah. now for months, the highest inflation in the G7. And there are a couple of reasons why. First of all, energy. If we're yeah. looking at how vulnerable the UK is to the European energy crisis, the war in Ukraine, sanctions in Russia, it is more vulnerable than the US and Canada. If we then compare it to European big economies, France and Germany, it kind of comes down to a labor situation, as well as imported goods like food. On the labor front, all of Europe really is facing labor shortages. But for the UK, it's not just pandemic related, it's also to do with Brexit. So certainly Brexit is a uh, confluence of factors, well. really. So what does that mean, uh, Bianca? I mean, this is going to be the big topic for whoever takes uh, takes uh, over as prime minister in September. You've been looking at the candidates. How do they stack up in terms of policy? On this. Well, they've they've now been repeating fairly rehearsed lines at this point. So as things started, Liz Truss was the one who said that she wanted to keep taxes low, appealing to the conservative base. Rishi Sunak was opting to be more honest with the country and say we are facing extremely challenging times. I'm not going to promise that because we have all this debt from the pandemic. He's changed his tune slightly. But before we even get to who's coming next, what the British media and public have been, been, been putting pressure on at the moment is the fact that we still have a Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who's now on his second... Really? I mean, we've heard we, a lot of things. We do. And we're in a great power vacuum great at the moment. News. Yeah, so being on his second foreign holiday in less than a month, it's not a working holiday. The country is facing an economic yeah. crisis, and there is a huge amount of pressure on him and the Chancellor, Dim Zahawi, asking, what, what are you doing to mitigate this? Now, if you wanted to be charitable, you could say, well, whoever comes next likely to change course from whatever might be decided now but we simply don't have the time for inertia if yeah. if the winter if the winter crisis is going to be averted or mitigated and the reality is as you know as we've been discussing for, for now for weeks is that this will affect the poorest the most so the action needs to be now especially i mean we heard from the bank of england but now we actually need policy here Yes, it's not just up to the Bank of England at this stage. They've raised rates six times. I think we're going to see more aggressive action ahead. But what about policy? What about helping the poorest in the UK? And I think when we look at inflation, it's very easy just to see it as a load of numbers. But for the poorest in this country, food prices, for instance, going up astronomically, 40% increase for a pint of milk over the last year, on top of energy prices, which between October of last year and next January, the average bill for energy will go up over $3,000 more. How are some households going to afford this? The answer is they won't. They need help. There is some help out there in various policies, but they're going to need more. And we are in summer. You know, yeah. heating isn't on. People want to know what is going to happen come September, October, when inflation may peak. What is the government yeah. going to do? 
Okay, come September, if, if, if it's Liz Truss, what does she have up her sleeve to try and combat this cost of living crisis? Well, the policies have been quite vague so far, and she keeps repeating her line about wanting to keep taxes low, as I said, because she is appealing to a sliver yeah. of Conservative voters, less than 1% of the British electorate en masse. And a lot of economists have criticised her plans. The majority is siding with Rishi Sunak, saying he has the more sensible ideas, yeah. even though he has been pressured into changing and softening some of his lines and saying that he would actually offer help to people to get through this winter and put emphasis away yeah. from other departments. Um, but that's why there is a sense of apprehension and why Labour have been pushing very yeah. hard as well, coming up with their own plans, which, again, we were discussing before, uh, don't seem to actually tackle the, the key issue here, which is rising energy costs for, for, British, uh, for British people. But they are arguing that whether it's Boris Johnson or whoever comes next, it doesn't yeah. really matter who's in government for the Conservatives or whether or not Boris Johnson's on holiday or not, that it's all a big party for them and they're not taking the plight of the British public seriously enough. Yeah, and I know a lot of people are on holiday at the moment. And those who can afford to be on holiday, to be completely honest, uh, but come, like you said, Anna, come September, that's when the reality starts to bite, and I think that's when the pressure is really on whoever takes over at number 10. Bianca and Anna, thank you very much. Well, Tehran has formally replied to the European Union's final proposal to save a crucial... All right, we're going to end it there. Sorry about the delay. Uh, I felt like that that information was crucial. I'm trying to hear what they had to say. It looks like that there is going to be a great deal of suffering and a great deal of anguish in the next two to three years. Um, hopefully we can reverse it and hopefully within six or seven years uh, we will have a, a, a present status at that time towards some sort of a peaceful uh, utopia or a peaceful uh, re 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 you know, resolution pertaining to all these problems right now that we're staring down. But if we do not watch, this thing is going to get totally out of control, just like they're talking about come wintertime and people's electric bills be extraordinarily high that will only exacerbate the problem and make things even worse. Once more, if the church world, if the Western world would have done the right thing going back 30 plus years ago, we would right now be embarked to be in prosperity as well as peace and we would not be engaged in seeing these problems that we're seeing develop all over the planet. That's what I continue to say and I say it out of love. I'm not trying to condemn nobody. I'm not trying to judge nobody. You know, the man that I was talking to this morning, the investigator, he said, because after I told him what happened to me out in, on Camelback Road in Las Vegas with the first uh, uh, Arizona Baptist Church out there that John McCain was members to, he said, well, did you not have animosity towards what these people was doing to you? I mean, they, they caused you to lose your job out in California. You lost your apartment. Um, they told you you wasn't welcome to the very church that you had become a member of there in Arizona whenever you come back. Um, and my reply was, no. I go, it's it's more let I'm more let down than I am angry or mad at these situations that regrettably the people put me through but once more I have to continue to go back to the cross what was Jesus's final some of his final last words right before he gave up the ghost father forgive them for they know not what they do and if I don't have that same array of not only gratitude but also empathy and sympathy for my fellow man then I am not going to be in the proper place where God expects for me to be towards following after the same characteristics as, as his son Jesus Christ I must continue to be graceful and merciful even as my heavenly Father is and was and still is merciful unto me. If I'm going to continue to stay in the goodness and the graces of God, I am going to have to remain steadfast in the same united spirit of God in regards towards 
being even like or as his son was. And this takes once more a day-to-day -day, uh, commitment. Uh, it takes um, it, 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 it takes a great deal of, of maturity. As you get older, you mature more in the Lord. Uh, you become more of control of your emotions, control of your feelings, and you also uh, understand the value of love and grace and mercy that much more as you get older and mature in Christ but at the same time you want to you want to you know use constru constructive criticism but by doing it out of love and not out of bitterness because if you're doing it out of bitterness you're not in the right spirit to begin with you're not in the right spirit that Jesus Christ was in within a few words of being his final words by saying father forgive them for they know not what they do to whom much is given much is required you know I still have to put under the pretense that the majority of the people that rejected this message 30 plus years ago me going to door to door house to house car to car going to all these different places they done what they done out of ignorance and not out of intention oh there was probably some of them done it out of intention just like there were some of them knew exactly what they was doing to the Lord Jesus Christ by by causing his death that day by by the execution. So, by ending that, by saying this, whenever Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do, those them was a certain amount of them that actually did not know what they was doing. The other them knew exactly what they was doing. Thanks again for your time, your patience, your prayers. Good luck to each and every one of us. And in ending, we want to say shalom. God bless you. God bless America. God bless our troops. And good luck to each and every one of us. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being a part. God bless. Four leaders are responding in outrage to comments made by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. On Wednesday, Abbas said Israel had committed, quote, 50 holocausts against Palestinians. His staff has tried to walk back his comments, saying his answer did not, quote, intend to deny the specificity of the holocaust, but was meant to condemn Israeli military actions in Palestinian territory.